go. Hello, everyone. We're going to give a couple of seconds for participants to jump in. As you join the session, we invite you to insert your name, title, uh, discipline uh, in the chat, and maybe where you're joining us from. You can see a couple of messages coming in. And I'll wait for like another few seconds. And then we'll start with the official remarks. Okay, great. Okay, looks like uh, participants are joining the session today. Um, so um, let's let's get started. Um, Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome all to the 20th National Mural Symposium uh, presented by Mural Roots. My name is Marta Keller Hernandez, and I am the Managing Director on Mural Roots. Um, it is a pleasure to join you all here today. We have a very exciting week ahead of us with an outstanding lineup of speakers, amazing artists and practitioners in the mural arts world. It is a great opportunity to learn from and connect with other like-minded individuals from across the country. For the first time, we're hosting the National Mural Symposium virtually with sessions scheduled throughout this week. This is sort of a new format for us, so please bear with us, bear with us as we navigate any potential tech issues or not feeling fully comfortable in front of the camera. We would like to be with all of you in person, seeing and hugging each other, but since that's not an option for now, let's make do with the tools at our disposal. There are some pressing conversations that need to be had, regardless of whether we can meet in person or not. And we hope this symposium accomplishes just that. But before we begin, I would like to invite Elder Duke Redbird to begin our day with a land acknowledgement in order to recognize the traditional territory of the indigenous peoples who called this land home before the arrival of settlers. Dr. Duke, Duke Redbird is an elder, poet, activist, educator, educator, and artist. With a legacy stretching back to the 1960s, he's a pillar of First Nations literature in Canada and has practiced a number of art disciplines, including poetry, painting, theater, and film. He was a trailblazer throughout the 60s and 70s, giving voice to indigenous people at major institutions and folk festivals across the country. From 1994 to 2009, he was an arts and entertainment reported, reporter for City TV in Toronto. He holds a master's degree from York University and received an honorary doctorate from the Ontario College of Art and Design, OCAD University in, two, in 2013. Duke Redbird is also featured on Native North America, which received a Grammy Award nomination for Best Historical Album in December 2015. Duke is currently recording with the Sultans of String and occupies the position as elder with the following organizations, Museum of Toronto, the Toronto Biennial, Summerworks, Banff Leaders Lab, and is artist in residence with the Urban Indigenous Education Center at the Toronto District School Board. Thanks to Elder Duke's teachings, I have learned that it is customary to offer a bit of tobacco wrapped in a rare color fabric as a token of our appreciation for joining us today. Unfortunately, I cannot do that today, uh, but I really want to thank you, Elder Duke, for finding time in your busy schedule to be here with us today and for creating a space to reflect on our relationship with the land before we welcome our keynote speaker. Thank you. Well, uh, as we say in Ojibwe, megwetch, megwetch, uh, big thank you for your kind words of introduction. And I want to say, Ani, Bojo, Sego, Tansi, and, and bring greetings uh, to everyone 
who's with us uh, this afternoon. Um, as Marta said, I am D Dr. Duke Redbird. I'm, a, I'm an artist and a poet. I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, I'm a great grandfather, and I'm an elder from the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation and a member of the Elders Council for the Districts, uh, uh, Toronto District School Board and uh, artists in residence at the Urban Indigenous Education Center. So it's a good afternoon to everyone and welcome. It's really a great honor for and, and a privilege to, to be uh, invited here today and uh, share uh, time with my uh, good friend and dear friend uh, of many years, Phil Cody, and uh, to offer a land ag acknowledgement on the occasion of this, the 20th National Mural Symposium. So this afternoon, I wish to share with you a, a very short historical tapestry that was woven by the many people who have had the privilege of being uh, the keepers and stewards of this part of Ontario uh, uh, since time immemorial. So uh, today I'm gonna just start the tapestry just uh, uh, about 12,000 years ago uh, when a group of uh, indigenous travelers uh, left their moccasin clad footprints in the blue clay beneath the buildings in downtown Toronto. Uh, this journey uh, by First Peoples took place uh, over 12,000 years ago, but um, that was uh, pretty well at the tail end of uh, the over uh, 200,000 or so years that Indigenous people have occupied Turtle Island or North America as we know it. Uh, the footprints were uncovered by a dredging crew uh, while doing some underwater uh, work um, at the foot of uh, Bay Street uh, back in 1908. So over the um, last 10,000 years, the Indigenous people uh, grew uh, and expanded into populations upwards of 25 million people uh, with over 60 languages and 500 uh, representative nations. And among these nations were groups called Wendat, uh, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, uh, Mississauga, and their, their ter territory comprised of all of Southern Ontario, um, all the way to, to uh, the Quebec and uh, Manitoba borders. Um, they, they, they were, uh, uh, the Wendat were known to the French settlers as the Huron. And that's, that's why we hear the, the word Huron often. And um, uh, the Huron uh, uh, people, uh, they say, came into this territory about 8,000 years ago. And most of them settled along the uh, Aramosa River, just, uh, just a little north of, of present day uh, Toronto or Takaranto. And the, the name Toronto originated from the Haudenosaunee word Takarato, uh, which means where there are trees standing in the water and uh, fish gather. Uh, the territory was a gathering place where trade, festivals, and social interaction occurred. The Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples found the area to be a natural meeting uh, place. And so too did those early settlers uh, who came from Europe and saw the value of the area and the access that Toronto has to the Great Lakes. After much deliberation, the Mississauga Nation of the Credit uh, considered a request from the European newcomers uh, for some land to create a permanent settlement. Uh, the Mississauga Nation, uh, agreed to share a tract of land uh, called the Toronto Purchase to the settlers on August the 1st, 1805. Now the protection and management of the land uh, has now been passed on to the present generation of the Mississauga of the Credit, who are the, the present treaty holders with, with the citizens of Toronto, of course. And we share a covenant with the indigenous community to care for this territory and a responsibility to continue uh, the tradition of compassionate stewardship so that future generations will continue to enjoy 
the unblemished beauty of these lands, remembering always that we never own the land, but rather we borrow its use from our children, grandchildren, and progeny in, into infinity. So a land acknowledgement is not traditionally about land ownership. We believe that we can no more own the land than we could own the air that we breathe. The truth is that we are the stewards of the land and each generation borrows its use for a brief time from our children and grandchildren. It was and still is our custom that when a visitor arrives from a neighboring territory to an unfamiliar community, we, we would bring a uh, pipe and tobacco, sweet grass, sage and cedar as gifts and would identify to the host community, in this case, Takaranto, uh, the path that we had taken and the challenges that were encountered on our journey. The visitor would reveal their name and nation and thank the host community for receiving them with hospitality. An acknowledgement to the host that they were that were that were visited would would include a declaration of their superb stewardship and gratitude for the manner in which they honored the Mother Earth. In this acknowledgement, there was also an endorsement for the wisdom and guardianship of nature, which I pay tribute to in the following poem called A Dish with One Spoon. The indigenous nations, Métis and Inuit, greeted settlers from across the seas when they arrived in their territories. Such beauty revealed before the settler's eyes was beyond the settler's ability to describe. In all the languages that the settlers spoke, they had no words that could evoke with any clarity a single thought that mother nature's splendor brought. It was from the indigenous tongues that the settlers learned the language of the earth in all her idioms. Toronto from Takaranto, trees standing in the water, a meeting place where small fish could gather, nearby hills where alders grow, that was called Etobicoke. And in the autumn, before the winter snows, the passenger pigeons rested in a place called Mimico. And to the west, where the great waters flow, the lake and lands were called Ontario. The eagle soars high with prayers for Manitou. The Mississauga people smudge and launch their birch bark canoes. The Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat too. Three sisters, corn, bean, and squash. The planting season has begun. Tobacco is offered a gift to grandfather's son sage, sweetgrass, and cedar to Grandmother Moon, there is peace, joy, and harmony in the treaty lands called a dish with one spoon. So we also honor and acknowledge the four directions, north, south, east, and west. We acknowledge and honor the four elements, water, air, earth, and fire. And we acknowledge and honor the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. These four seasons represent the circle of life. The spring is for children and observation. Summer is for adolescence and listening. Fall is for adulthood and remembering. And the winter is the time of the elders and the time for sharing. So in closing, as an Anishinaabe, wisdom keeper and elder, I would like to offer everyone this blessing this afternoon. During this 20th National Mural Symposium, let us remind each other that we are becoming the ancestors that seven generations from now, the grandchildren of our grandchildren will be seeking the wisdom that we have learned and passed on in our lifetime. In closing, I wrote this poem that I believe contains the guiding light to take us forward into a sustainable future. And it is called 
our mother, the earth. A great mystery created the universe and fashioned a blue geosphere, a radiant planet, the mother earth, the genesis of all we hold dear. With all the billions of stars in space, only the mother earth could create the perfect human birthing place. A little sphere of cosmic dust was the spark of spirit given to us. In all the years of her existence, with benevolence and generosity, she provided for our subsistence and never needed or asked for our assistance. But now the world is in distress due to unrestrained excess. Nature reveals that true progress is possessed by every plant and tree that echoes every breath we breathe in a symbiotic symphony of connected sustainability. In the present tsunami of climate change, the earth may never be the same. With 8 billion people and mouths to feed, the fires are burning, there is less air to breathe. We must conserve and preserve our rivers and forestry to ensure our own continuity. We must activate, contemplate, and regenerate the life and abundance of this, our birthplace. We don't choose where we are born. We are the outcome of a cosmic storm. And our journey is to search and find the natural order of the divine. Joy and enlightenment is the gift this wisdom brings. Adore and cherish all living things. Acknowledge the cradle of our precious birth and our relationship with our mother, the sacred earth. I wish you all much success in your deliberations today and throughout the rest of the week. And I thank you for this moment to share with you these words. And I say, Chi, Megwetch, big thank you to you all. Megwetch. Thank you so much, Elder Duke, for your teachings and uh, beautiful words. I would like to invite uh, Rebecca, yes, to say a few words. Thank you. Thanks, Marta. Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Elder Duke Redbird, for your words and for sharing your experience with us. My name is Rebecca Stubbs, and I am the chair of Mural Roots Board of Directors. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today celebrating this 20th National Mural Symposium. I'm happy to be part of this achievement. 20 editions of the symposium have taken place across the province in the past 27 years. And we've welcomed speakers from all North America to share their knowledge in mural art. Obviously this symposium looks a little bit different than the previous, but we're so thankful that you all came out to support our arts community. You're still going to get some incredible sessions with really relevant topics and you can wear your pajamas and hug your cat. So it's still a good time. First off, I wanna say a huge congratulations, give a round of applause to all the artists and industry like. You made it through the past two years with your head held high and that wasn't easy. Our industry was one of the hardest hit and faced a huge uphill battle to push through to the other side. With any large projects put on hold or canceled, I know you all felt weary at times. I know I did, but we prevailed. Whether it be new digital art forms or never um, before seen graffiti art walking tours, a lot of pieces, um, and special pieces were produced and I for one feel lucky to have been part of this process. So good job, everyone. <laughs> On that note, I want to acknowledge quite remarkably that Mural Roots is celebrating its 27th anniversary this year. Incorporated in 94, Mural Roots was born to promote wall art, murals as public art form for the general benefit of communities within the province by commemorating unique features of those communities in which murals were located and to inform communities, government and other government agencies as to how murals provide benefit to these communities. 
Since then, Mural Roots has grown into an organization that has embraced mural art as a way to change the feeling and the face of neighborhoods in the busy urban sprawl of Toronto. Mural Roots has created over 50 murals in the past 25 years in collaboration with a wide array of communities and artists. From creating murals, we expanded our efforts into mentoring youth, supporting artists, and encouraging communities to create public um, art, always following our motto, teach, learn, share, and grow. Mural Roots has assisted many communities and artists in creating outdoor murals that enhance their neighborhoods. The organization has be become the go-to place for education, information, and advice on mural creation, and continues to serve a large network of artists, <clears throat> managers, organizations. In 2016, we launched the Mural Art Learning Institute, Institute, a continuum of training programs in all aspects of mural making. On behalf of Mural Roots Board of Directors, I would like to thank everyone who has been part of the organization in the past 27 years. Members, past program participants, today's symposium participants, funders, sponsors, donors, partners, volunteers, board members, and staff. We thank you for your commitment and your dedication. More specifically, I want to add that the National Mural uh, Symposium would not be possible without the generous support of our community partners, Neighborhood, Art Net Neighborhood Arts Network, and YYZ Artist Outlet, sponsors such as Street Art Toronto, STC Canada, and RBC, Mural, Root Mural Roots members, and all of your program participants. We thank our funders, the Toronto Arts Council and Ontario Arts Council. Lastly, I want to take a moment and share a few words about my predecessor, Rob Watson, who sadly passed away last month. On behalf of the board of directors and staff of Mural Roots, we thank him for all he did for us on the board and in the community. He contributed so much to the organization through his support in our field. As past chair, he was passionate about the work the organization did to support artists and culture in the city of Toronto and his relentless and passionate contributions were greatly appreciated and valued by all. I only hope to be half the chair he was at Mural Roots and I aim to do him proud. Rob took us through the past two tiring years with confidence and levity and for that we will forever be grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for those words. Um, I really hope that Rob is listening from somewhere. Um, and thanks again, um, Elder Duke, for being part of the symposium again this year. Um, it really means a lot to us to have your teachings uh, with us. It really grounds us in, in the work that we have ahead for the, uh, you know, for, for the week ahead, really, for, for the symposium. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, and now to continue with um, the official remarks. And as we get closer to 1 p.m., um, I just wanted to say that the National Mural Symposium, for those of you who don't know, the National Mural Symposium is a professional development and networking event for mural artists, administrators, and mural producers to teach, learn, share, and explore current trends and challenges in the field of mural art. This year's theme, representation, spotlights one of the main challenges the mural arts sector is currently facing and will continue to face in the years to come. Who gets to produce murals? Who gets to have a say over artworks that live in the public realm? Who, what is depicted in these artworks? In our internal discussions regarding who might be this symposium keynote speaker, it was an easy decision. Philip Cote. Philip has brought large scale indigenous art to the public. I am sure you've seen his artworks all over the city and beyond. Um, today, in addition to speaking about his mural practice and the themes incorporated throughout his mural art, um, Philip will discuss the importance of sharing indigenous teachings with a wider audience, as well as utilizing mural art as a way to reclaim spaces, land, time, and history. This keynote session is co-presented with YYC Artists Outlet. 
And now a little bit of a bio. Um, Philip Cote, MFA, Moose Deer Point First Nation, is a young spiritual elder, indigenous artist, activist, educator, historian, and ancestral knowledge keeper. He is engaged in creating opportunities for art making and teaching methodologies through indigenous symbolism, traditional ceremonies, history, oral stories, and land based pedagogy. Sitting, sitting all his Sorry, citing all of his ancestry, he is Shawnee, Lakota, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Algonquin, and Mohawk. Philip is the seventh generation great grandson of Shawnee warrior and leader Tecumseh, and his ancestor, Amelia Chechok, is the granddaughter of Chechok, who was the first signer of the Toronto Purchase of uh, 1805. So before I pass on, the mic to Philip. Uh, I just have a couple, a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, this webinar is being recorded for archival purposes and uh, probably for sharing through digital uh, platforms later on. Uh, live captioning is being provided by Michelle Mahe and Patricia Deshan from uh, National Captioning um, Canada. So you can actually like uh, turn the live transcript on if you need to. And then, um, Safety, uh, if for whatever reason this event is compromised by someone sharing hateful or violent videos or audio, and it has happened before, not to us, but to other organizations, the webinar will be ended by staff and follow-up information about rescheduling, if relevant, will be sent via email. Uh, in terms of support, um, please send Jackie Santos, membership and technical coordinator, and our webinar host a message on the chat if you need tech support during the event. Um, Janine Beatty, Program Manager at Mirror Roots, is moderating the Zoom chat today, so feel free to say hi as well. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the conversation, you can send them through the Q&A feature uh, here on Zoom. Uh, we will have some time around 2 p.m. or so to, to answer them. So without further ado, Phil, it's all yours. I can only say that it's a true pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, we, we cannot wait to, to hear your keynote. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here. I just wanted to start off with a traditional acknowledgement. Ani, Baju, Tanzi, Sego, welcome everyone. Anishinaabe, Ajini, Kajwan, Nochmoa, Mishkogiyash, Gichi, Manadu, Anishinaabe, Indota, Mishupichu. Nin Anishinaabe, Shawnee, Lakota, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Algonquin, Minwa, Mohawk. So that's my uh, traditional uh, uh, acknowledgement when I start my presentations anywhere. I just want to say too that it's, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be selected by Muir Roots to be the keynote speaker. And uh, it's great to be introduced with uh, my dear friend, uh, Duke. Redbird, who read the most uh, exquisite poem about our Mother Earth. I feel the same about that. And uh, I'll start here with my uh, PowerPoint presentation. I'm prepared to uh, I prepared a series of images that I want to share. And um, I'm just going to get it set up here, guys. Okay, so everybody, is that good? I hopefully it is. So uh, of course, you guys heard my uh, my introductions. Here it is again. Uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on this one because this is uh, something that I wrote. But you know, my work uh, it starts somewhere. It started somewhere long ago, long before I was here. So that's kind of interesting when you think about things this way. And so for me, as a, a you know Anishinaabe blood. I, I want to start with the beginning of the universe and the great black void. So this is a great way to start the process of being able to talk about the work that I do across the city of Toronto. So the original being sent out uh, these thoughts into the universe four times to see if there would be an, um, somebody calling back. And there was no response. So the being called these thoughts back and in doing that said, as you come back to me, create light in the universe. And at that, all the stars were born and all the plants began to form until a planet that could hold life. But 
here we have an image of the light and dark in the universe. And this is the essence of the Anishinaabe cosmology. This is saying that everything in the universe is made of this light and dark. And so this is a really, not very tricky, but for some people not knowing anything about our culture, it could be. So what we're saying here is that the, the first thing in the universe, there was a spirit in the great black void. And that spirit called light into the universe. And that was the beginning of the physical world. So that's how it is in our cosmology, that it is the spirit that came before the physical world and that these two merged and created this reality that we're all experiencing here. And we call this, uh, you know, light and dark or physical and spiritual all connected together. So how does that go into this? Well, this goes into this because this is so one of our ancient forms of, uh, of documenting our history. It's called the Birch Bark Scroll. It's uh, been painted, well, the original one was painted with uh, red ochre and uh, painted on the birch bark. So you can imagine a birch bark scroll with this red ochre image across it. And this is a really great tool. I, I always uh, like this piece. You know, I first encountered this piece back in the uh, late 90s and I, I put it in one of my first murals, um, my large scale murals. So in the beginning, you can see there is this little circle with these four men around. So that is the four winds. So they're a, mis they're a mystery. We don't really know who they are. I mean, I have an idea who they are, okay? But it's a really important uh, visual because this kind of sets up this idea that indigenous people do indeed understand their cosmology and it plays out throughout their whole lives. And even through our history, we recognize that that chemistry that happened that brought life into the universe. And so you see these little, uh, I think they're little pathways are on here and they go crisscross back and forth across the main pathway. And what you're looking at here is a diagram of this, uh, these two worlds, the physical and the spiritual. So the physical world is the top part where we are all on. And uh, underneath is the spirit world, and it's reflecting both in these both worlds, which is really interesting and uh, thought provoking. Uh, I can't go into the whole detail. I know a lot about this, this uh, image because I've studied it for years and years now. And it's come, I've come to the understanding that the little man between those two tall sticks, that's the arrival of the first human. And then there's these breakthroughs beyond that. And then you see the double circles. That's the two earths that were made before the last one was made that could hold life. So that single circle before those three teepees, that's our earth. And that circle between there and that tree with the eagle is a lifetime of a human. So we talk about this journey of the original man across the land. And what he did was he created this, um, I guess, like a map that all humans will go through these four stages in life and they'll experience these four stages and this will become part of their wisdom as they journey across a lifetime. So that's where I'm gonna end it right there. You know, there's more to talk about here. I could probably talk about this for three hours, but we're here to talk about the mural work. So I think that's really important for this day, but maybe sometime in the future, I'll talk more about this. Maybe I could probably talk about this for three hours easy. Okay, so let's go on. And I just wanted to just point out some things that were important to me as a young artist. And here's one of the images, that I, you know, cause I'm a sculptor too. So I, I work with soapstone and this is an image of uh, Norval Morris. So, so in one ear, he has an eagle speaking and in the other ear, a serpent. So, you know, that's pretty much the way his life was. He was these two forces and, you know, he was always challenging himself and challenging the world that he lived in. And he was a man of two worlds, just like most indigenous people. We live in two worlds. We live in an indigenous world and we live in a Western world. And we have to. It's important that we do because one of those worlds contains our identity. And that's really important. We need to take that with us when we go out into this world. And you know, if you have kids, make sure they have a handle on who they are by showing them what our culture is about. So that's what I'm showing here with this sculpture of, of Norval Morris. So this was done in 1995 and I started carving in 
1990 and I carved for you know many many years and I still carve every once in a while when I'm called to but I wanted to bring this in because Norval Morrisso is the one that made the woodland style painting so famous and everybody around the world understands that that kind of painting relates to the indigenous people here in Ontario and why Ontario because this is the home of the Anishinaabe Ojibwe Algonquin people we are the original people of this land. Before anyone else arrived, we were here for many, many years, thousands and thousands of years. Uh, so I'm gonna go on. And uh, this is one of my first major murals. This is a thousand square foot mural. It was a collaboration uh, with myself and Tracy Anthony and the community of New Credit. It was they who sponsored the, the mural. They wanted something, somebody, some way of telling their story. So we did uh, a whole uh, visual on the creation story of the Anishinaabe. And the, you know, the, I guess the origin of this story comes from Edward Benton Benet, his book, uh, Mashomas, which means grandfather. And in that book, he talks about all these stages of the Anishinaabe as they travel across time. And this was a way I could think of telling the story was breaking it up into these little vignettes of a story each and it travels across the whole top of the painting and all the all that really nice graphic work at the bottom that is all Tracy Anthony's work and all my work is at the top it's kind of halfway in between realism and uh you know that kind of woodland style but this is a great way for me to really understand our story I began to realize that it was important that this story get out there. You know, it's great that it's in uh, New Credit and anybody can go there and see it, especially when the school's open and maybe after the pandemic's done, people can go and check out that mural. But, you know, I, I don't see it for usually years at a time. So I'm really, when I do see it, I just remember, wow, this looks incredible. You have to see it in person. These photographs don't do it justice, you know. But it's a, it was one of my first big works. This is what brought me into the world of public art. I realized this is what I wanted to do. This is something important to me. And I realized this is a good place to be able to tell our story across the land and uh, have a reflection for the indigenous people to see. It's good for the settlers to see too, but the indigenous people, you know, many, many times, many cases, you know, I grew up in Toronto and I never saw a reflection of myself or my people anywhere. And uh, all the things that I did see was uh, made up versions of uh, us through the media and Hollywood. So it's all negative. And uh, so for me, I wanted to see a positive story about who the indigenous people really were. And uh, so my journey began when I entered elementary school and uh, I started hearing these uh, stories about Indigenous people. I never liked what I heard in the elementary school or in high school. And, and I always argued with my teachers about what I was looking at and what I was hearing. I couldn't believe that our people were, you know, these kind of always portrayed as these villains. So it's time to change the story. And uh, this is the way I was going to do it was by looking at where our people originated from. What was our original stories? This is the arrival of the first man on the on the land, and you can see the mega shell up in the air, and he's arriving, and he travels across the land, and he's you know, his first brother is the Maig and the wolf, and his uh, his quest in life, after having a family, was to find out why he was here, and he had to make a journey to the mountains to see his father. You can see his father there holding the pipe in the mountains. And he goes to find and ask, why am I here? It's a great story because, you know, it's the story of all Indigenous people. All Indigenous people wake up at some point in their lives and they ask, why am I here? And it's a great question. We should all have one question like that, you know. So this is the other side of the mural. You know, you can see that uh, map that I talked about. This is the first time I use it in artwork. I put the map right up on the top of that part of the mural here, you can see central part of this image here. The map is there in full color in that red ochre. And you can see the seven, the seven uh, fires 
This is them in the human form arriving and talking about one of the prophecies. And then on the uh, far right here, you can see the drum and all the children. So this is about our original stories, our voice, our songs. And, uh, and this is about passing on knowledge from one generation to the next. Well, that's why the children are in this, because it's the older people in our community that pass on that wisdom to the young ones so that they have a sense of identity and a sense of purpose and a sense of peace from knowing who they are. This is another part. This is the story of the Great Flood. And this is an important time because, you know, this is probably much later on in the Anishinaabe history. This is when the flood happens. But for here, in our, in our stories, it happens around, around 9,000 years ago, 9 to 8,000 years ago. So it's just another important story that uh, talks about the history on the land. It really plants our feet here on the earth, here in uh, you know, North America. And this is the uh, meeting between the sacred fire keeper and uh, the first man, and, and the meeting between uh, the first woman and the first man, and how they were the beginning of our humanity. It was they that had these four sons that went off in the four directions and began that cycle all over again. I'm shortening it quite a bit here because there's a lot of murals that I've done. And I wanna just be say a few words about a lot of the works that are here. Uh, this is my first major work that brought my idea of bringing the woodland style image out into public space. I was working at a, a youth shelter called Tumavit up on Vaughan Road. I was there for about two and a half years. And at that time, I was also working in the prisons. And for both of these places, I realized I had to bring in uh, projects into the program in order to help the young ones to understand who they were. So one way was to talk about who we were, talk about it from this you know, perspective of this woodland style art. And so this work was created and designed by me, but I had all those youth help me paint this and learn the story as we painted. This was the best thing that I could give them because I wanted to give them something that could encourage the reasons why they were here, why they had to try for something more than what they were doing. Because a lot of these youth were homeless and they were used to being like that. And so for me, I wanted to find a way to light their fire so that they would think about their lives in a more important way and that we were connected to something even greater than this contemporary um, settler world that we, uh, we exist in, you know, we're in a, we're in a Western bubble. So and that Western bubble didn't include indigenous uh, narratives. And so this is important for me, important for all the young ones to bring those narratives to the forefront, to help them to understand why it was important to be indigenous and why it's important to be indigenous for everyone. You know, um, <clears throat> the settlers needed to know who we were too, because like us, they were given these, uh, these media uh, Western narratives about who Indigenous people, they were not given stories about us by us. And I think that was the key thing for me, was turning that this around, beginning to now tell our story the way our story was told by our ancestors. It was really important to have elders around to transmit these stories. And uh, this continues on, you know, I'm at Allen Gardens. This is a few years ago, you know, there was a, a, a big water project that came into the city of Toronto and they dug this gigantic hole into the ground at Allen Gardens to set up a, uh, a link between these pipelines and uh, this water going into the city of Toronto. It had to go pretty low because it had to go even below the, uh, you know, the uh, sewer systems that were already installed in the city. So uh, while they were doing that, uh, we had an opportunity to create a mural. It was Tannis Nielsen who was in head of the project, but uh, you know, I applied for this project too. And uh, well, somehow I managed to get in there anyways. So this is the work that I created for it. And I wanted to just kind of build on this idea of this uh, Anishinaabe arrival and creation story of the first humans and what they experienced. And I kept in line with this kind of woodland style painting and I tried something different. So I'm always experiment 
as an artist and uh, it's uh, important, you know, that, uh, you know, as an artist, we, we, we change with times and uh, we, we take what works and then we leave behind things that didn't quite work. So you'll see as we move on how my woodland style begins to really take shape even more strongly than this, this mural here. But this was a nice stepping stone because it was quite a large project. This was about uh, 5,600 square feet. It was a big mural. It goes right down to uh, Jarvis and uh, goes, you know, we're kind of halfway through the middle of Allen Gardens up at the other end. It was a great project and I had a lot of people helping me. Uh, community members were part of this. We did a community consultation to get people to know, let people know what we were doing and that it was okay by them that we were gonna continue. So that's what happened in this project. So I was learning about, really learning about community stuff. Not that I didn't do that with uh, you know, the New Credit First Nations, the Mississaugas, we did community consultation there as well. And, we left a legacy that at that one because we trained three young artists to paint on that mural the whole time I was there. The mural took eight months to paint that one that was at New Credit. So this was a nice project. Uh, it was an extraordinary project, and you know, um, I wasn't. I didn't know what to expect. I was invited to do this project, and uh, this went under the uh, old mill subway station. And you know, just to the, the other side is the Humber River. Uh, but these uh, these columns were uh, quite extraordinary. They were quite large columns, and uh, they're amazing looking when you see it from this angle. This is looking from the bridge down at the uh, you know the crossing where the subway goes across the river. And uh, the backdrop of these is uh, you know Quest was one of the other artists that were part of this uh, collaboration. And Jarvis, uh, another well-known street artist, he was the one that created the animals and the fish that are in that big blue space. And so my work is, of course, the little mandala, or as I call them mandalas, but you know, these are like uh, circles. Uh, and this is about indigenous cosmology and the way we see things. Very circular, very holistic, everything is connected together. That's what they represent. And they represent the different stages of our creation stories as well. As you can see here, uh, we have the original being in the universe, creating the universe, calling those uh, stars and as you know, calling the light into the universe. And so I modernized this a little bit. I didn't make little stars. I made it the, this is a mathematical equation of what the universe looks like and how the stars have spread out all over the universe. That little feathery object that's painted yellow that's a mathematical equation of the universe. And we have that original uh, being, of, of, uh, we call the great mystery, bringing that light into the universe. So this is the beginning story of the Anishinaabe Ojibwe Algonquin people. And in the background, you, you might have to ask like, why, why we have this big blue background? Well, the reason why we have this big blue background as we talk about many different doorways in terms of our cosmology and how we structure out our belief system. And one of the ways that we do is called the medicine wheel. And the medicine wheel has four elements. We have water, air, fire, and earth. And those elements are really vital in terms of uh, how to think about our world and how to think each element. If any of those elements are missing, there is no life. So all of those elements are important. And so the water became a really important part of this. And that became the dividing space between the physical world and the spirit world. And that's why the water is represented here as a background because the water is the doorway to the other world, the doorway to the ancestors. And so uh, Quest and Jarus and I, we had a ceremony down there before we did the project together. I really wanted them to understand our cosmology because I felt that it was really vital and important that they get and understand the purpose of this work because we were going to work together and I really wanted to have them uh, really understand and be a part of this you know not, not just be a collaborator but I wanted them to be a part of the understanding of this cosmology and these stories that were being spread out in this public space under uh, you know 
a really important tool, which is transportation across the land. And of course, indigenous people understood the value of transportation as we trekked across the whole of North America. And even the Anishinaabe, you know, they went from Toronto, from the East Coast to Toronto, out to the Rocky Mountains and down through to Wyoming and down through Central America and back up through Mississippi because we had a great trade network that was here for 5,000 years in Toronto. So these are little bits of uh, history that people just aren't aware of until, you know, uh, Indigenous people start talking about them because it's not something, it's not a narrative that's common at this point. It's still on the margins, but the more and more Indigenous people understand our real story here, the more and more this narrative will come to the forefront and change the way everyone sees the history of the land here. Arrival of the first human is walk on the earth and all the uh, wildlife and animals he encounters become part of the cosmology. And so the fish represent that underworld and uh, that's what those spikes represent, radiating out from this circle they represent connections into the underworld because they're all connected. The physical and spiritual run side by side everywhere in the universe. And our understanding through the cosmology is a, is a map that shows us what it looks like. And so that's why this woodland style art has become even more valuable to me because I realize that this, that story is embedded in the way these designs were created. Because you know, the black line on all these animals is that beginning of the universe, the great black void. Okay, so this is the ice age. This is uh, one of those people we call the ice runners, Okoming and Niniwag. And he encountered all these animals during the ice age and he hunted along the uh, hunting corridor, which was Davenport Road. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, that uh, there was an ice wall that came down during the ice age and it rested right along the edge of Davenport Road and went all the way along there to, to Annette Street and across over to uh, Babby Point and then up northward to the 401 and then across 401. That's where the ice wall rested in Toronto but it was a great hunting ground and our ancient ancestors were hunting for these game during that time. And I just wanted to show some of that history that was on the land and begin to have a place where we can start uh, sharing the narrative about our understanding of the history of the land. You know, because when you think about it, you know, the settlers and uh, Western ideas have only been on this land for 400 years. But the Anishinaabe people, they've been out here for tens of thousands of years. And so we're talking about a really much older story, which I think is really valuable and important because, you know, it's the indigenous people have a great understanding of what a relationship is to the land and how to maintain balance. And so some of these stories are going to be very important in the future as to how the indigenous people manage to keep this pristine continent until the arrival of the Western people. That, and that changed everything. So Indigenous people understand something and we need to take those thoughts into the future. That's kind of the message here with a lot of the works that I do. And this is the original man and woman being sheltered by the Thunderbird and the little birds representing prosperity and the radiating lines, you know, out into the uh, underworld representing our connection both in the physical and the spiritual sense. This is the story of the great flood. This is about Turtle Island and about all the animals that were part of that little story. You know, you have the uh, otter, you have the fish, and you have the uh, muskrat, which was the main player in that story, how the muskrat went down to get earth from the bottom of the water to save the animals and save humanity and how he, he did get the, get the earth from the bottom of the water, but he uh, perished in that. When they say that's the reason why there's so much, much muskrats right now, the creator blessed this little animal with uh, prosperity of uh, plenty. So there's, you know, there's a lot of muskrats across Canada 
uh, thanks to his bravery and the story that we share when we talk about the great flood story. But I wanted to keep these uh, really uh, bright imagery because, you know, we're under a bridge. It's under, it's cast in shadows most, most times. And even now, you know, it has a lot of light under it uh, because of the angle of the sun. But sometimes there's a lot of darkness out there and I wanted to keep a bright spot. And, you know, when you go into the park, even on a, on a dull day, this, uh, this turtle is glowing in the background under the bridge. So just thoughts, you know, just uh, putting a little bright spirit in the, in the vision of the people as they march past these, uh, these murals down in the Humber River. So this is some of the work of these two artists. Uh, Quest is the kind of really graffiti style on the bottom, and Jarvis is the amazing kind of, you know, uh, study. You know, he's a master painter. Doris uh, is the guy that can paint the portrait and can paint animals with the same skill as a portrait. And you can see it here that you can tell that otter he's underwater swimming. And he's uh, poking his head down, looking at the graffiti work that was done by Quest. And so Quest wanted to keep it in uh, kind of the line uh, with the colors that he chose for this nice word. And I'm pretty sure it says his name, um, but I'm, I'm having a hard time reading it myself. <laughs> but I, I love the work, it looks great. And it, uh, it's kind of a blend of uh, a graffiti style work and uh, woodland, you know, look at the colors. It's very woodland style colors in there. So what are the woodland style colors? You know, I, I always ask this of all the students when I go into the schools working with the students, because you know, I do a lot of work uh, where I teach young people how to draw and paint when I do work in the schools in Toronto and in the region as well. But I ask, what are the seven grandfathers? And of course, they all know bravery, love, respect, honesty, humility, and so forth. But each one of those grandfathers has a color. And I think that's important that uh, the students get connected. So when you look at the woodland cell painting, it's still seven colors. So red, black, white, yellow, blue, green, and violet. Those are the main colors of woodland style painting. So this is a painting I did at uh, Spadina DuPont. Uh, it's a great work. It's called uh, History of the Land. It's a, it's a land acknowledgement, really. It's talking about the nations of people that ended up on this territory and down through history. And uh, we talk about the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, we talk about the Cree or the Ojibwe, um, sorry, not the Ojibwe, but the, uh, the Chippewa, the Mississauga, you know, and then the Haudenosaunee, of course, and then the, you know, some of these symbols are really recognizable, like the Haudenosaunee symbol, you know, that's the, that's the Confederacy, the original one, that's the five nations right there. That's the symbol of the tree in the middle with those uh, boxes on either side. Um, that's the main symbol that everybody knows regarding the Haudenosaunee. But the Anishinaabe, you know, this is probably recent in the you know, last couple of decades that this black thunderbird has emerged. You look at it on the other side and the black thunderbird represents the Anishinaabe people. And it's a mystery. And I think it's in connection to the seven fires, you know, the sacred story we talk about these prophets that came to the people, they call them the seven fires. And I think that this black thunderbird is directly connected to that story. And uh, I can't go into it here, but uh, maybe at some other time, I'll, I'll be happy to share the story about these seven fires. They're important because they're part of the prophecies that talk about what we were gonna encounter, even in our lifetime, what we are experiencing in the last, since 1960, you know? That uh, was a big change for Indigenous people. Uh, a lot of our uh, cultural practices, language, um, stories, and celebrations were outlawed until 1960 because you know they were afraid of an uprising until that point in time. I think that's an important thing that everyone should know that Indigenous people could not vote until that time either. So these things are small stories and uh, you know, there are these people who are movers and shakers in our community 
uh, known as activists, but they were real leaders and they were bringing about changes and talked about the injustices towards Indigenous people. And it's those stories that were brought forward. The reason why I know about these stories is because I knew these activists. You know, I know Vern Harper, I knew Floyd Hand, I knew uh, Edward Benton Benet, uh, and I, I met these people when I was young. And I, I didn't really understand everything that was going on, but I knew it had a lot to do with uh, the stories and the narratives that I experienced growing up, all these negative stories about Indigenous people. And I felt that strongly in my heart, always that this was an injustice to always have these stories told by other people and not by Indigenous people. So this is our story on the land in a common place. And not too far from the Native Canadian Centre, it's just, it's just north of the Native Canadian Centre. And a lot of people in the community, they love this work. Uh, not just the Indigenous people, non-Indigenous people were really attracted to this kind of work because, you know, it talks about, it's easy to read, you know, it has our four medicines. You see the tobacco up near the, the Thunderbird there. And then right under the moccasin, that's the cedar. And then right under the canoe is the sage, and under around the bear is the sweetgrass. Those are the four medicines of the medicine wheel. So on the east we have tobacco, south we have cedar, in the west we have sage, and the north we have sweetgrass. So they're all connected to all these different nations. All these nations use these medicines in their ceremonies and their rituals, and it's about connection to culture and land and how there is very little. Um, distance or space between anything that we do, everything is connected. It's a great thing and a great way to live. So here's the close-up. So this image here, this is a self-portrait I did uh, when I, uh, my, 1998, I did a self-portrait. I wasn't feeling good at the time. My life was really changing at that point. And I decided you know, maybe a good way to heal myself was to do a painting of myself. So I did one and it changed the way I saw things. And uh, so I ended up on this mural. So it's a nice uh, kind of give back, you know, you get something from, from something, doing something good and you give it back, you know. Another close up, you can see the tobacco plant, how it looks, it's beautiful looking, you know. Uh, that's the other thing about uh, you know being an artist. Uh, we're we're our, we are researchers. We're always looking, researching our stories, what we're going to paint, what we're going to depict, what story, how do we want it seen, what's important about this story, and and do we need the background information for everything we paint? Of course we do. We have to have the background in order to create the narrative that we're going to speak about this mural. It's important. That's the way artists are. I don't know if they're all like that, but I'm like that. I feel that's important that that research be part of that so that you can really speak about your work. You know, this is the Wendat um, icon or logo. And uh, I did some research and I found that I was going to choose the wrong one. And uh, so I ended up contacting the Wendat headquarters in Quebec and they sent an image that said, this is our logo. So they sent me this really great image of the beaver on top of a little beaver dam, or maybe it's his house, with the three birds over top, you know, which are the Canada geese and the snowshoes, the sweet grass surrounding that. And the canoe is part of this logo as well. So you have the four animals, you have deer, turtle, bear, and the wolf. This is the symbols of the, the Wendat people or the, the Huron, as many people know them by, they know them more by the Huron than they do Wendat. But it's a, it was good, it was a good education for me and I realized this was important and then we put that proper logo on to, for, you know, to bring justice even you know, to this work, this contemporary work. It's good to know and be in line and being uh, connected with the community. And that was part of this story too, is getting connected with the community and making sure that we were portraying their, their likeness and it was gonna please them. You know, even the Mississaugas and the Six Nations were part of this. So here's just more details. I just put all the major animals that were symbolized North America, the buffalo, the bear, the eagle. You know, these were really important 
icons on their own. And this is a historic mural I did, Tree of Niagara. I did it in 2017, Massey College. Uh, and it was in connection with the Mississaugas and Massey College. So they asked me to come up with an, a work that they thought would represent this connection together, this contemporary connection. And I said, well, we should do something on the Tree, Tree of Niagara because that's the first time that we see a Western and indigenous uh, iconography on, on an object. So look at the wampum belt below. You can see uh, indigenous kind of pictographic uh, communication along with um, numerous, numerous can be created from the Western perspective of the mathematics systems that they use. So this is the first time that these two connect together anywhere in the world is on this wampum belt. And uh, so there's a lot to be said about these stories, these historic stories. You know, uh, Sir William Johnson is like one of those major figures in history who was an uh, Indian agent for the British. You know, even though he was in the States, uh, his headquarters was down there, but he was, it was British territory at that time. And uh, it was important to start talking about this treaty. We always hear about it in terms of like a very settler kind of uh, military kind of image and story. We don't ever hear that there was indigenous people involved in these things. We don't hear about who those indigenous people were that were around you know, this treaty that was formed in uh, indigenous way, which was the wampum belt. And we never hear about the origins of that, but my thinking is that the origins came from um, uh, Molly Brandt, who was uh, Sir William Johnson's uh, partner. I don't know if they were ever married, but I, I don't think they were, but they were definitely a man and wife. And uh, I'm sure that this is where the knowledge and understanding of that wampum belt came from. Because at that time, if you're not a historian, you won't know, but at that time, uh, so many treaties have been broken. The indigenous people were tired of signing these pieces of paper that seemed to always break. These people would always break these treaties, so they didn't want to do it anymore. And that's the reason why this wampum belt became important because that was one of those important treaties that was needing to be signed because it was control of the territory. It was the beginning of the, you know, this uh, govern governance of indigenous lands by one, one, uh, one nation, which was the British. They wanted to protect the land and say that no, no indigenous land can be sold without going through the British crown first. And that's the, that was the beginning of uh, indigenous people uh, finally getting representation in North America. So this story is very complicated. And uh, these portraits were all the indigenous uh, nations that were a part of that, or some of them at least. And you can see a background. There's a great uh, image with all the nations kind of sitting around that campfire being treated by Sir William Johnson. And his soldiers were there. And uh, Molly Brandt, though, was the real star in terms of history. This, this is the silent part of history we don't hear about. We don't hear indigenous people getting credit in history. So this is like for me turning that around, bringing Indigenous people to the forefront so that Indigenous people could get the credit for doing important things in a historic points throughout the formation of this country. So we look at their regalia. This is all kind of traditional regalia by each one of these different nations. And I wanted to show this kind of detail so people could see um, you know, how beautiful it is. These, they were very proud people and they wore the regalia with great dignity and pride. Many of them were great speakers because they were all leaders that came to these places, um, especially during these times of uh, you know, peace treaties. And that's what this really was, it was a peace treaty. So, you know, Massey College, you know, if you wanna go there and check out this mural, it's quite large. These uh, panels, uh, these little square panels on the top, those are eight feet tall. And of course, so this is uh, 16 feet long. And at the lower, this goes down another, this is 17 feet in total. So this goes right down to the, down a stairwell 
That's why it's shaped like this. Because there's a small wall with a stairwell on an angle. So that's why this mural ended up going right down the staircase. I wanted to maximize the use of that uh, whole wall. And uh, so these are on panels. Why uh, they're on panels is because if it ever needed to be moved, or if there was ever an emergency of any kind, that the work could be taken out of there and stored somewhere. Or if necessary, if this went into a national show, it could be taken out of there and it could be mounted in a, in a museum where people can see it in larger numbers than they do right now. But you know, it's good work. Uh, this is another really nice job that I did. It was a uh, it was a real test of uh, perseverance. You know, this was a very difficult wall to paint, but uh, it was a great uh, community space. You know, first people leading to the eighth fire is what the title of this piece is called. And uh, I had a wonderful assistant named Nellie. She's still with me right now. She's even here with me today. And uh, there was also, uh, we collaborated with a gentleman named Jim Bravo. So Jim Bravo is kind of like an accent on this piece because uh, the amount of his work is right where it says Roncesville, that's his work right there. And then some of the little buildings on top are part of his work too, but the rest is my work. This is the woodland style kind of surrounding Roncesville, uh, changing the landscape. You know, this is a really kind of old uh, settler kind of neighborhood. It's a real Polish neighborhood. Uh, I lived there for a few years back in the eighties. I loved the place. And I love the shops, you know, great meat stores. If you like kielbasa, that's the place to go. And uh, lots of bakeries now. And uh, it was a good place to live. And uh, so I wanted to tell the story about the original people. And I talked about the first man and woman, talked about the great wolf, and I talked about the thunderbirds being part of our cosmology and our stories. But I wanted to talk about the landscapes as well. So I put all these different animals you know, the birds and fish representing prosperity, the moose representing the wisdom of the forest, the bear representing this uh, connection to the medicine people and territory, and uh, also, you know, protection. The bear represents protection. And on the other side, you see the big thunderbird going round to the, and uh, you can see the buffalo standing there. And of course, our medicine wheel. The thing that people all recognize as indigenous uh, icon, most people do know that medicine wheel is an indigenous icon. And of course, uh, the great forest in the background above with the sun coming. And it, uh, it took us longer than we thought. This was such a porous, porous brickwork and wall. Uh, we had to use these small uh, filbert brushes. They were all probably about, I don't know, like a, an inch wide. And they were kind of flattened, but they knew they were, they were needed to get the paint into all the crevices. This was uh, quite an undertaking, but it still looks great today. It's beautiful. We had a great uh, community kind of launch when it was done. Uh, we had well, well over 100 people standing on the street here. The mayor was there. It was a good day. I was pretty happy with that <laughs> after all the sacrifices, of course. So this is a, here's a nice little detail. You can see some of the, uh, the texture of the wall. Uh, we did try to use rollers where we could, but we ended up using the small brushes mainly to look after this wall. And they, they want to do more with this space here, but it's, it was difficult. And then of course, COVID stopped everything in its tracks. So it never ended up happening yet. So we'll see, maybe it's still going to happen. But you can see it's kind of really the woodland style painting with a nice model background with the, you know, the, the different blues that are in the background creating these patterns. It was uh, quite nice. And you can see the buffalo better here. And you can see the thunderbird going right to the ground. It's uh, pretty wild looking, <laughs> I would say. I like it though, because it's uh, very playful. It's uh, meant to be inviting, not meant to scare people off, but meant to help people to think about what they were looking at. So here I am working on one of Nick Sweetman's big murals. It became a collaboration after, um, you know, it was important, you know, Nick creates such beautiful works across the city. 
he uh you know he's a master uh wildlife painter i would say but there was something really important and something was lacking in this beautiful work and that was indigenous representations you know because when you think about um audubon or these wild any of those water wildlife painters uh the problem with those wildlife painters it's is it's more colonialism so how can that be colonialism well i'll tell you because it's a single narrative again there's no indigenous narrative to speak of the land how the indigenous people saw the land so this is my part i'm playing in his work i've become this partner and collaborator and i brought our cosmology into his work i didn't have to pretty much do anything he did all these amazing colors i just painted these black lines on top I brought all the major icons of indigenous cosmology and our and our connection to the wildlife into his painting and i wanted to make it look like it was kind of you know emerging from the amazing painting that he was creating across this huge space i mean he was pretty lucky to get this gigantic mural space to paint for the city so here's a, a side shot of uh, some of the works uh, it was pretty hot out that summer uh, i have the bear coming across and he looks like he's part of the milky way it's incredible and uh yeah he would be a good person to, to partner with again just to continue drawing these kinds of images because you know that's really like birch bark scroll imagery uh riding across the top of his paintings and i have the great bear representing the eighth fire and i have the, the fish representing the underworld and the connection with the two worlds you know the reason why we have that black image is the beginning of the universe so bringing that cosmology into his works was, um, I wouldn't say it was simple, but it looks very simple just having that black imagery on top. I mean, I'm pretty proud of the work. I'm happy with it. I'm glad that it uh, worked out well with uh, Nick's work because, uh, you know, look at his work. It's amazing. Those colors are so vibrant and uh, illuminating. It's like they're, they're translucent and we're looking at kind of like an image of space somehow. But the bear and those tracks, they work really well. There's a great Thunderbird as part of this too. I wanted to bring that uh, co-creator into the, the, the telling of the story. And of course, nice image of the fish. Two versions, you know, we have Nick's kind of uh, woodland or sorry, Audubon style of uh, fishing, I mean, painting. And then you have this woodland style painting. So this is the medicine wheel. And this is talking about the different powers that indigenous people see the world through. And uh, you can see the big serpent under here. And look at the little globe around the outside of the big circle. Uh, can you guys give me an idea what it looks like? It looks just like the COVID. Uh, you know, that little COVID model where you have those little T's on top of the, the sphere. It looks just like that. And it's uh, it's an interesting. I thought it was. We looked at it after because we did a, a little mini documentary for a street art. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, total, total, oh, sorry. Lakeshore Arts. We did a, a little documentary. It turned out really well. I was happy with what they did. And I was happy with the interview. But I did talk about that a bit. You know, sometimes... There's a lot of images that are prophetic, you know, especially with our ancestors. There was a lot of uh, prophetic works that were on painted on walls that were on there for hundreds of years, and yet they still apply even today. This is the tale of the Thunderbird. This is the Mishupishu. So this is the most powerful being in the underworld for the Anishinaabe people. This is our protector. When we go down into the underworld, that is our protector down there. This is the buffalo, spirit of the buffalo. And this is the original family. This is at Center Court Condos. Oh, it's one of my favorite paintings uh, in recent times because it's so, so enormous. It's probably like four stories in the air. 
it's 37 feet high, uh, roughly around 120 feet long. It's, uh, it was a great uh, uh, opportunity to be able to paint an indigenous uh, narrative on a wall so big and, and in such a great place. It's in the center of our city at uh, Jarvis and uh, Dundas. And um, so many people from the community, I've gotten so much good feedback. They go just to see it. They wanna go check out and see where this work is. Just they take a walk down there, they take a drive down there just so they can take a look at this. So well, the good thing about this is it led to another one that I'm gonna be doing it for Anishinaabe Homes. There's a new building being built at Church in Dundas. So it's not far from this one, but there's a new work I'm uh, putting together getting the designs together at this point. But uh, it's uh, 25 feet by 21 feet. It's quite big, not as big as this, but still, I'm happy with it. And uh, this one, you know, very simple, Thunderbird, original man and woman. We have the gathering of all the animals. This is about our naming ceremonies. The beginning of our uh, culture, you know, talking about naming ceremonies, that's a really important place to talk about, like how do Indigenous people get their names? Well, you go to a naming ceremony and you get an elder to kind of find your name in the, uh, in the, in the spirit world. And they, they look for your name, they look for who you are and they bring your name together. You know, like my name is Nojimo and that's the first name that I knew of uh, when I was a young man. I went to a naming ceremony and um, they said, your name is the healer. So uh, it was important to me to get that name. I didn't know it was my destiny that I would be working towards this somehow. So for me, getting that name was uh, with the beginning of uh, a deep search for identity to find out who and why I was here. And so that name, Notch Moen, I asked the elder, I said, so how did you find that? Uh, how did you find that name? Where did you see the name? What what happened? How did you come up with this idea that my name is the healer? And uh, he said, he said, well, he said, I saw you. I saw you standing in front of a, a huge crowd of people and you were talking. And he said, you were, as you were talking, this purple violet haze was going down over all these people. And he said, right away, he said, you were healing them. And he said, with your words, and he said, the other important thing is, he said, but he also sensed and saw that I was getting healed from it as well. So, you know, it's a win-win situation to get up there to share the narratives of the Indigenous people and not only helping other people, but helping yourself. I think that's what we all need to do in this world. Things are changing, and that's what we need to think about, our personal journey in this world and why we're here. So here's my friend, Duke, Duke Redbird. Uh, we did a project together uh, with my museum, uh, the Chichimong Wigwam, which means uh, houseboat. <laughs> I don't know if I'm correct there, but <laughs> uh, definitely it was a fun project. Uh, it was down at the um, Ontario Place. Uh, there's like a, a dock behind Ontario Place. So if you take the, uh, there's a walkway off the uh, Queensway onto uh, the island, you walk right around to the back there and you'll see this great little boat there uh, where there was lots of teachings, lots of uh, sharing that were happening there, ceremonies were happening there and uh, connection to the land, connection to the water, connection to history. And of course, uh, all this stuff was being brought forward by, uh, you know, our scholar uh, and elder, Duke Redbird, who was a big part of like the whole uh, making of this project. So I was really happy to be part of it, part, really happy to be asked to be part of it. And, uh, you know, like Duke says, we've known each other for a long time and we're, to, we're even related way back. So my work was this uh, Thunderbird and the Otter talking about these two places in history, talking about the land and connection to the water. I tried to keep it simple, but it's hard to. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was, wow, it was baking out that summer, of course. 
we had plans so we put tarps up eventually and we got smart and put tarps up so we could keep cool under the shade and look at here it is in motion looks fantastic it was a lot of fun and it was a great trip when we uh, first launched the boat now it was pretty scary because uh, at some point we thought well the water thank god it was so calm because uh, the boat was uh, pretty low in the water but it was a lot of fun <laughs> it was a lot of fun driving across that lake uh, going towards ontario place from our launching place which was over by the humber river so that was a great day There it is parked on the dock. Look how inviting that is, you know? Imagine getting a chance to come here and talk with the elder for a few hours. I think a lot of people took that opportunity up and I imagine Duke was pretty busy the whole summer talking with people and sharing the culture and, you know, just bringing his positive energy out there into this public space, you know? And it was a great project by my museum to support um, that, um, you know, that sharing of our culture, history, and narratives uh, through uh, this amazing elder. This is at Bigford Center on Bloor, right across from uh, um, Christy Pitts, you know, just on the south side there, Bloor. Uh, it's a project. They invited me to be part of this. Um, there was a, it was a collaboration. There was many artists there doing work as well, uh, but this was my section. I thought I wanted to do a turtle and a Thunderbird, you know, these uh, kind of old icons that are easily understood. A lot of people know them. They're very popular. It's always important to tell a story again. On the other side, this was the uh, white buffalo. So one of those legendary stories that talk about these, uh, these amazing uh, places in time. You know, I think a lot of people don't, they heard of the white buffalo and there's even been uh, a more recent version of that story about this white buffalo being born in Wisconsin. <clears throat> and uh, the elders from, uh, from Lakota country in South Dakota, they went there to confirm if that uh, was real, this was a real white buffalo. So they went there, they did their rituals and they, the offerings and they sat and waited and they watched this buffalo turned from white to yellow, to red, to black, back to white. They said it happened. So they said they knew it was the real messenger coming to talk about these times we're in right now. We're in the eighth fire, you know? And uh, the day of the beginning of the eighth fire started on January 21st this year. That's what those elders told me long ago. I held on to that knowledge. I thought something more, I thought there was gonna be a big sign of something, but the big sign was that it was, it was gonna come, that something, uh, something was on its way for years and years. We were seeing signs probably for the last 50 years, we were seeing signs of this seventh fire going into the eighth fire uh, by way of all these young warriors and elders and speakers that rose up to talk about the injustices and bring justice to our stories and bring our stories out into the open, our stories from our narratives, which was really vital and important for the next generation to know and to hear. And, uh, you know, even our local elders, Duke was part of all this stuff too. He was in the middle of all these great changes. But there was a lot of leaders here in Toronto that were part of the American Indian movement who were part of this too. So this, this image, you know, this stirs all these memories for me. I think about it in the present. I don't think about the ancient story about the original white buffalo calf woman that brought the sacred pipe to the people to teach them a new way of doing things, being open to this idea of spirit. That's what that pipe, that's what it represents, and that's what it is. It's a connection to the spirit. You know, whenever you put that pipe together, you're connecting to the spirit. And the spirit is unknown, you know, and it reveals itself in many different ways, sometimes through signs, sometimes through visions. It's something you need to practice, you know, and uh, it takes years to build up this kind of understanding 
Uh, and I have that experience now with all these years of connection with ceremonies and understanding and seeing things too. And I'll have to do one of these uh, talks where I just talk about all that stuff. <laughs> So here's uh, the gathering of the clans. This is the boardroom table for Rogers communication. It's quite large. I'm thinking this is probably about maybe, I don't know, at least uh, 14 feet long. This is the, these are about four foot high panels or tables. There's three tables attached together. And um, so we have the original man and the wolf again. But this, look at the background on this, it looks so amazing. Look at all the amazing little details with the flowers, the birds, you know, and the turtle looks exquisite and, and uh, beautiful. And uh, that's, you know, that's what you wanna do. You wanna create a story that is also beautiful to look at and something that mesmerizes you. And I am mesmerized by some of my own paintings. I just love the way they look. It's a different thing when you're there painting. It's sometimes it's a struggle getting through the work, making the work look exactly the way you want it to look. Because, you know, when you're going to do these paintings, you know, you start off with the drawing, you like the drawing, and then you realize that you need to add more. It can't be just the drawing, it has to be more than that. So all the background details began to uh, be considered and they were added. These were secondary thoughts. So all that little swirling designs in the blue, that was a second thought. And we wanted to change the way that kind of presented itself that it was the fluidity and water moving you know just like the ocean moves just like the water in our great lakes is always moving so you wanted to have that you know to bring that into kind of some kind of uh, animated kind of experience here's another view this is the woman on the other side she has a great tattoo on her face flowers in her hair I have all the major animals that are part of our clan system. I have the beaver, the deer, the birds. I have the marten, the crane, fish, the loon, the wolf, all the clans that are here in common in this territory. But all the nations are on this table. You know, it's, uh, I gotta have something like this in my house too. <laughs> you know, that's the crazy thing about an artist. And most artists usually don't have any of their own works in their house houses they just they put it out there they keep putting it out there you know they don't do anything just for their own homes although i do have some nice works here but i don't have any of these kind of great works in my house but i guess that's something i'm going to consider now that i'm talking about it here here's what it looks like all dressed up and installed this is their room this is a the room that was a legacy space for gord downey cheney wanjack fun I feel honored to be part of these kinds of projects because this is uh, about change. And it's about, you know, uh, changing the narrative, bringing justice to, to the history of this land. You know, we, we talk about uh, residential schools. We don't often uh, talk about these individual stories of these young people that experienced what it was like to go through these residential schools. And so for me to be part of this project, it was a real honor. And um, I'm glad to be part of these uh, physical changes on the landscape, you know, talking and then now uh, in the media. So the media is picking up these stories and uh, because of the, the TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, our stories are, our stories, our narratives are more being heard out in this media world than ever were before. So by Indigenous people, which is a, a great turn of events. You know, to be an artist in this time is to be very lucky. So I consider myself very lucky to be an artist during these years of this great change. And I don't think it's an accident. I think there was a purpose, you know, and uh, I was an artist since I was a child. So this is work that I'm very proud of. I love this work, uh, work is the power of the land. And of course, this uh, name of this piece comes from Duke Redbird's poem, Power of the Land. And it was about these two, uh, two opposites meeting on the same landscape. It was about industry, and this is about cosmology and history, indigenous versions of that uh, meeting on the landscape, what it would look like. And, how important is that 
that we have this is well, it's really important because this is the original story and this is what has become of this, the landscape where this original story was born. So we have these uh, competing kind of uh, dynasties. There's a, a collision course and it, it's always been bound to happen and it's been happening for 500 years. This collision course between the indigenous people and the Western people and the way they do things. So this is this is very political in some ways. And uh, you know, who thought politics could ever be beautiful looking, but here it is. Politics and its beauty, and we have these industry of the oil industry, and we have the refineries, we have the mining trucks, you know, for the oil sands, we have the uh, representation of the original sources of those uh, fossil fuels. You can see the big dinosaur with its back here coming out from the land represented by the, uh, you know, the head of that uh, gas pump is the, the head of the dinosaur now. <clears throat> so these are all, are still, you know, looked at through this indigenous cosmology and it's important that we begin to see this transition time where it's going to go, how is it going to go? And uh, I believe this thing, this piece was about 37 feet long. And uh, well, let's move on. Here's some details. Nice, it's done right on the wall. I was going to tell you guys something. I told these guys to have it on panels, but they didn't listen. And you know what? The whole company is moving now and they can't take this mural with them. And that notes. Remember, when the artist talks and they make suggestions, you should go for it. <laughs> it's sad. But I'm thinking of actually making another one on panels like this one because it was so nicely done. I don't know where it's going to go, but it would be nice to create another one like this because I thought this was such a beautiful mural. The people at the company, they loved it because they would often just find an excuse just to come up into this section of the company so they can look at this mural, which is kind of nice. So this, uh, this, this force coming out of the woman's mouth is connecting to the man. They're at their connection. They're connecting together, they're in communion. And their stories are both going across the land. They're both connecting with all of the nature. That's what the symbol is. And this, this kind of nice, beautiful ring that sits behind a woman, that's life force going across the land. And that's who the woman is, this life force going across the land. And, and it's even part of our cosmology now, because when we think about this original woman, we always remember the morning star. And that's the star that comes up in the morning before the sun rises. That is uh, the home of our first woman. That's what they say. And so her energy comes up before the sun. That's new life coming. Across the, across the land every single day, every time that sun comes up. That's what these rings represent. So this is for Maple Leaf uh, MSL, MLSE. Uh, this is like a, a training facility. It's also where they have, a, 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 I guess like a, a summer camp for us for kids and they have uh, daycare and stuff for, for young people, uh, teaching them to become more athletic, teaching them about uh, eating properly. Uh, so they, they wanted to have something in there that connected with them and they wanted to be indigenous. So I incorporated the basketballs, the hockey sticks and the roller skates because originally uh, that location of the building was, uh, was a large roller skate rink at one time built during the turn of the century, you know, 1900. And uh, I thought, well, okay, so I had to make it kind of playful so the students could enjoy the mural and they could find a way to relate this indigenous culture with these contemporary modes of, uh, you know, uh, exercise and being athletic in sports. So I had the, the original two people and I had the Thunderbird, I had the turtle, I have the great fish and the otter coming at the bottom. And then I have mixed in with the hockey sticks, the basketballs and the roller, roller blades or roller skates. I thought it was kind of fun and it was a good project to do. And uh, so I wanted to kind of really make another connection here. And uh, so I didn't paint the background. 
I didn't want to paint the, the concrete. I liked the idea that the concrete was part of the story. Just as, you know, we look at the Canadian Shield and it goes right across the top of Ontario. And on that rock, in many places, are these pictographs painted all over the rocks, talking about the stories of the land. So I wanted to keep in that frame of mind and I just painted the image right on top of the, uh, the concrete and not worry about painting a background. It's good I did that because, you know, let people know that uh, there's a connection, you know, that the Indigenous people are still here painting their stories on rocks. And uh, today's rocks in downtown Toronto are concrete. There you go. So this is the one I did for Scotiabank. And this is also for the Cheney Wanjack, uh, um, Gord Downey Cheney Wanjack Fund. This is another legacy space, but this one's in uh, Scotiabank, right down at uh, Queen and, and Bay. And uh, this is a really nice size mural here. I'm pretty sure this is about, uh, this must be uh, 16, 16 feet by seven feet, um, woodland style. It's about the, uh, it's about one of the prophecies of a boy uh, that would return, who would be dreaming about all of our stories. And he would dream about where the sacred um, birch bark scrolls were kept. And he would bring all these stories back. And he would, um, he would learn how to decipher all the images that were on the birch bark scrolls and tell us these stories. And so it reminded me of Cheney Wanjack, you know, that uh, his life was, uh, was, was a struggle you know, when he went into the residential schools and his dreams were to get home. And it totally reminded me of this boy's return and this boy was coming home too. And he was gonna bring all our stories back to life. You know, kind of like these paintings. These paintings are the same thing, bringing these stories back to life, bringing our home into the present, you know, talking about our culture and our cosmology talking in this case about our star knowledge, you know, that, you know, you can see the, up there you see the big fissure at the top of the corner of the painting in blue, and then below you can see the loon. So these are two different star constellations that our ancestors knew about. So the loon, the tail of the loon is where the morning star, or sorry, the North Star is. And the North Star is really important because the North Star is the one that can help us uh, when we're lost, if we ever get lost in the bush, at night, you can just look for the North Star. And if you can find that, if it's to your right or your left, it'll tell you which way you're facing. If it's to your right, you're facing west. And if it's to your left, you're facing east. And you then you know there's the north, and you know where south is, then you can find your way home by seeing those star patterns and looking for them at night. If, you know, hopefully that never happens to anybody that's listening to this. But, you know, if I've been lost in the bush before, it's quite scary. Luckily, only for a few hours, not like for days like some people. But uh, this is the message, you know, behind this image, you know, talking about these sacred spaces. And I have the two worlds here. I have this kind of border. This here on the bottom section of the mural, you can see this black line representing the landscape. And underneath it representing the underworld, the changes that are coming, you know. And here's the rest of the site. It's a beautiful project, you know, bringing the stories to life. You know, this, even if it's a sad story, we need to hear it because this is a reality for Indigenous people. It's a legacy that we all face. We're all part of this residential school um, tragedy uh, because all of us are affected by it. And even if you didn't go there, you know, people that did. And if parents or relatives went there, that goes right down through the chain of, of um, generations. It's affecting even present generations now. Even if it happened, you know, three generations ago, it's still affecting you. So, you know, these are things to think about. You now we need to think about long-term healing, what that really looks like and what it means. So this is Little Canada. That's such a snappy looking place. Look at that. This is the entranceway. 
and you can see I got laid out here the six panels. I did designs for them. Uh, it was a land acknowledgement. Sorry to interrupt, but, Phil, but yeah. it's like 20, 15, 2.15. So um, if we can start wrapping up, I would like to allow participants to you know, ask some questions if needed. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. I'm going to just, yeah. I'll just travel through this pretty quick then if I okay. can. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So what you can see here, um, you can go to Little Canada and take a closer look at detailed shots of what these words are. It's a land acknowledgement that represents the history of this place. This is uh, another part of the uh, Little Canada. This is a 30, 27 foot long mural, nine feet high. This is the 13 moon calendar on the back of the turtle. And of course, the, this is another calendar. You can see the circle of stones. That represents the medicine wheel. That was another kind of calendar that is connected to the 13 moon calendar on the turtle's back. This is inside Little Canada. You can see the mural in the background. And this is another part talking about the ice runners, talking about the ice wall that was here in Toronto. So this is some details about, this is all you know, elements that I designed for them to add to this. So if you go in there, you're gonna see all this nice woodland style imagery connecting this land with indigenous people. It's not just a settler story anymore, it's an indigenous story. There's a mix happening. This is a Sundance tree talking about renewal. That's really what the Sundance is about. It's about renewal. So this is, uh, uh, this is the Red Door Family Shelter. This was commissioned. This is all this year, this stuff here. You can go check that out too. It's down on uh, near Logan and Queen. There's the inside. Nice, right? I think I'm just going to go and check out all these murals now that I've talked about them today. I'm going to go for a ride. This one's just up on, oh, sorry. This one's on um, Brock and uh, Bloor. Uh, you'll see it there. This is a gathering of the, the animals. And this represents the, you know, the sacred ones, the white. So I put the white moose in here to remind us that we're in the eighth fire. This is one I did in my neighborhood. This is right down at uh, Kipling and Lakeshore, right in front of the, um, Humber College, uh, the indigenous uh, section of Humber College. Uh, this is about the um, Grand Council that was held down in the park. And there's the backside. They left the marker tree in the park there so that you knew that they did a Grand Council down there 200 years ago during the War of 1812. So this is work that I did at the Council Fire. And um, it's again talking about our culture, talking about the animals. I mean, there's a lot of this, uh, this connection to the land and to the animals, it's important. I, I'm not able to talk about all the details with connection to why that's part of it, but that's really important to see all of these different images that are connected to our narratives and our stories. I, I think because those relationships are really part of the future, just like the land acknowledgement is. This is on uh, streetcars. I don't know if they still have them on there, but it'd be nice if they still do. You can see that there's uh, a really nice uh, cross view of the history and the way they merged, uh, these many different nations emerge across this landscape here. So the two sides of the streetcar. Look at that. So uh, originally, so this is, uh, okay, so I'm not gonna do that. This is the church. This is the, uh, this is the uh, original story of the arrival of the first human. This is him arriving, those four bears coming down first. And then he arrives onto the earth, the turtle's back. This is a school I recently did out in uh, the region of Toronto. This is Lisgar. Um, This is something I did for uh, Veterans Day. This is for the Indigenous veterans. This was done for Sunnybrook Hospital. And uh, this is new. This just happened like a couple of days ago. 
And they even uh, painted the image onto the grass there. So they said it's going to be there all year. And look at the little flags representing our indigenous warriors and leaders and the, all the battles since the uh, beginning of celebrating Remembrance Day, which was from World War I. Miigwech, everyone, for uh, listening. And uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Bill. We truly appreciate it. And again, apologies for interrupting. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I don't even know what to say. Your artworks are outstanding. And I truly admire your commitment and dedication to the artwork. Um, not rushing it, doing the proper research. Um, it's, it is truly outstanding. And um, I know we can't see other people, but I'm sure right now there's like a heartfelt round of applause for this really, really amazing presentation that you just did for us. It's really great to see, you know, like a big, your big body of work um, together. It's, um, it, it's, it's truly outstanding. Miigwech. Well, thank um, you. Yeah, I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, we have like, you know, like time for a couple of questions if anybody has yeah, sure. um, any questions. I, um, if there aren't any, I do have some questions, but uh, I would rather offer the opportunity to participants first. <laughs> I guess maybe like while people type it in the um, in the Q and A feature, um, I can start like I'm, I'm going to be like quite selective what what um, what I ask. Um, I really liked your comment about when the artist speaks, listen to the artist. Uh, when you were talking about this Angkor mural uh, and how like the artist is always more knowledgeable uh then the client uh that's something that um we face on a daily basis at mirror roots so that that was really nice to hear um i i made one i did make one note early in your presentation um and i wanted to ask like how um important were these um early commissions i guess like early artworks um large artworks in the public realm like how how did that shape your career? Like being able to access artworks that were, you know, like, um, yeah, like larger in nature, like, you know, located at Allen Gardens, which is like a place that it's, you know, visited by many. So how, how did this shape your career? Do you think that having these opportunities early on uh, allowed you to access other opportunities later on? Oh, yes. You know, that's a, that's a key important thing that you're saying this because you know unless you get an opportunity you don't ever get a chance to see what you can really do people have to put a certain amount of trust in uh, your ability to to uh, finish um, and complete these projects and I think that's the one thing that artists often don't get is a, an opportunity to start something but you know it's nice to have a small body of work so they can see what you can do First of all, so for an artist, you know, get your stuff going, start uh, producing artwork and start cataloging your work so that you have a great presentation package to deliver when asking to do these kinds of work. That's the beginning is the artist needs to be prepared and they have to have some connection to the work that they're applying for. That's what I've learned from myself is that, uh, you know, even I've applied to many projects where I don't get a chance at all because there's a lot of art artists out there. And they, I, I think one of the things that you don't plan on is the, the committee selecting the work, having a good understanding of what they're looking at. So if you have a committee and there are no indigenous people on there that can really speak about your work, you're probably not gonna get a vote because no, nobody can understand the importance of your work. I mean, that's, that's the view, a circular view, because you have to be seeing on both sides in order to really understand how do you get yourself into a, a realm where you can start doing public art. And I think sometimes you may have to make sacrifices. And that means uh, maybe sometimes you have to come in a lower cost than you want to go in. And sometimes opportunities come because you've donated your time. 
to being part of these bigger works. And I, I think that's what, uh, that's what I've experienced, that sometimes I had to come at these lower costs, but it didn't bother me at the time, um, not financially, because, you know, I'm always in financial straits when it comes to, you know, because as an artist, you're yep. either raking in the dough or you're in the poorhouse. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, well, th thank you for that. Um, yeah. It is, there is definitely a financial aspect to this, of course. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions. I've just been really mindful of the time that we have. Uh, we have a question. Um, it asks, what inspires your artistic style for each piece? Is it based on which style will be best help tell the story? Yeah, no, that's, uh, they practically answered that themselves because it's true. Um, it depends on the piece and where I, so when I get a piece, well, I do a lot of works for schools. So I usually do research on that school, uh, their history, the history of the site where the school is at, see if there's any significant thing that I can talk about to anchor it into the neighborhood so that the students can know that they're learning something about their neighborhood. That's my kind of main uh, way of uh, figuring out what's important to put in the mural, is finding out the history of the location first. And is that important? Of course it is for schools, because a lot of schools don't even know that they're on historic sites. And I open up this new kind of uh, corridor of history from an indigenous lens for the school. And at this time, the indigenous um, content that is going into the public school system these days have a lot of this uh, TRC connection to it. So for them, it's important to connect not only with an indigenous artist, but to have this kind of indigenous content connect with their, directly connect with their school. So, you know, some of the schools were near uh, Wendat sites and I might talk about the Wendat people my understanding of them and I'll bring that forward and I'll bring the history of the land forward. And so when I do that, I present an idea and I ask the school, what do you think? Does this look like something that is, you agree with? Is this something that your students might understand or relate to? And when I get the nod, then I just go ahead with the design and I complete it. I do a line drawing first so that they can see exactly what the image is gonna look like before color. And then I said, this is the whole layout right here. And so when they get it, uh, they, they like it or they don't like it. So I've had one school say they didn't like my design and I changed it. And well, I made it better, you know? And so that was a bonus for them. And it's good, you know, because, you know, people are free to say they don't like work. If they don't like work, they should say it. You know, that's important. If you're going to be a purchaser of art, it's going to be whatever you like. And yeah. uh, I'm open to, you know, to criticism. I think that's important. It's, it's good for the artist's ego as well. You know, you're not perfect and you don't make the perfect design every time. <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's great. It's really great to hear you say that. I think that's a big, a really great piece of, of you know, like knowledge um, for, you know, for the various people who are participating today. Uh, let's see, there's another uh, question here. It says, you mentioned deer, turtle, bear, wolf. Do they represent each section of the medicine wheel? Turtle, turtle, deer, bear, wolf? Yep. Oh yeah, you know what? That is the Wendat uh, symbols on the canoe. So that those are the okay. symbols that represent the Wendat people. And that's why they put those symbols on that canoe. It represents the landscape and it represents their idea of pers you know, um, prosperity. So for the medicine wheel, it's the turtle, eagle, buffalo, and bear. Those are the four animals of the medicine wheel. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna do one more question. Um, this question is, what is most important for non-Indigenous artists to know if they want to collaborate with Indigenous artists? And then it says, thanks for the great presentation. I believe this is coming from Nick Sweetman, this question. 
Okay, well, I think um, having a sense of respect uh, is really important because respect goes a long way. You know, and people know when they're getting respect right off the bat. So for me, uh, how do you make that happen? Well, you know, I'm in a Western world, you know, and so I bring that Indigenous narrative to the forefront in cosmology. These things have to be understood uh, for the collaboration to work. So I usually do a ritual with people that I work with uh, because I want them to get involved uh, with me in a spiritual uh, indigenous way. And so, you know, we might do a, a smudging ceremony together. We might do a pipe ceremony together. But I'm seeing once this pandemic's done, we're gonna do sweats together. We're gonna do a sweat together. I think that would be really important because these rituals are like, um, you know, like a, like the Christian people have uh, when they're uh, they're bringing their children into their belief system. They have a christening, uh, or when they or they have a baptism. You know, that's the same thing. That's what a sweat ceremony is. That's what a pipe ceremony is. Bringing this culture right down into the moment on the people in these uh, circles, trying to make uh, a relationship. Build. And this is a good place to start, you know, because that is where we open up this doorway of cosmology. And I think that's important that these rituals become part of a handshake. That's an Indigenous handshake, getting our cultural practice in the midst of these agreements. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, that was, yeah, that's, that's, that's great to hear, I'm sure, by many um, there's been a lot of interest in the past for, uh, from artists that we know of who were interested in uh, partnering in a project with an Indigenous artist. So I think that's, um, that's very valuable what you shared. Um, we don't have any other questions and it's past 2.30 uh, and I see some of the participants have already left. We could, hear, we could listen to you and hear your teachings for like forever, Phil, but I can only say that it's been truly a pleasure. Oh. oh. I'm going to oh, do we have one more thing before yeah. we go, okay? Of course. This this song is for all you guys that are still listening, okay? <laughs> Thank this you. Is a, this is a traveling song. Well, not a real traveling song, but I'm going to say it's a traveling song. But it's a Sundance song. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Tatakuya Sinakishnu Kasa Takashala Oyete Omie Mai Pilamai Takas. All my relations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Phil. Appreciate it. What an amazing way of uh, wrapping up today. Um, thanks again. Um, we will connect via email later on, but uh, thank you. Thank you for that. I just wanted to tell everyone that um, we're done for the day today, but we're back tomorrow at 1 p.m. with a presentation by Estrella Toronto um, about their water hoarding project. So I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day um, with this amazing performance by Phil. And um, yeah, I encourage you to tune in tomorrow. Okay, thank thanks. you very much. I'll check it out. Thank you. Take Bye. care, you guys. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.